Okay, so let's <coughs> try this tea. Okay. Maybe I'm gonna show it here. Sure. So, so what is that tea? Um, so this is technically not you. <laughs> this is Gudam. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, this year's spring material. Uh, so hopefully you can have a try of something not you, since we've been drinking you teas the whole time. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so why do you say it's technically not you? Um, so there's a bit of confusion on the on the you area. You mm -hmm. now is technically one mountain range. Yeah. A very large mountain range, but it doesn't include the other five of the six famous mountains. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we'll take a look at the map later. Um, and have a look at the six different um, big mountains of the sure. eastern Shishwantana region. Yeah, but the six different mountains um, from which Iwu is by far the biggest one by production, right? Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, because, yeah, the other tea mountains, it's actually, I think, only a couple of villages that, that still have gusu and, and still produce tea. Right. As far as I know, it's mainly rubber tree plantations now. Yeah. And many, like, if you go on the Ibang road, like, all around Xiangming. Hmm. Rubber, banana yeah. plantations, yeah, all sorts of stuff like that. So, so do you think in the past that they would have much bigger plantations, the same size as Iwu? Um, I imagine they probably had a, a, a more relatively similar amount mm -hmm. in terms of density. Um, but Yibo has always been the largest mountain range, so they've always had a, a larger overall production. And that's uh, one of the main reasons it was traded out of Yibo, is because that was the, you know, a oh. bigger collecting point. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you have any idea of why they would focus the production, why they would center the production around Yibo? Because, well, if you look at the current borders, it's quite far on the on the Lao border. Well, it, it's right at the border, so why would you put your main platform uh, so far, actually, mm. and so far from Jinghong? And, um, it's, it's more of a historical mm -hmm. reference, because, um, you know, thinking back to the Tea Horse Road era, like tree was traded along those paths, and you can actually trace. Like uh, uh, they've actually repaved the Tea Horse Road through Yibo, yeah. and so as a historical reference point, it's still being used. Uh, it was revamped as as uh, you know, even though it's not as accessible, that historical historical reference point gave it importance enough for them to continue using it uh, once they oh. uh, restarted trading from those areas. Mm. So like uh, all, all the tea producing areas would actually go through uh, Yibo and okay. uh, there's, actually, there's actually a point, I'm not sure how historically accurate it is, but there's a point in Yibo if you go there that says that is where um, the horse caravans stopped to rest and uh, would trade with traders uh, at that point as well. Okay. So if you go to Yibo you should probably have a, have a quick look. Um, Although I think we talked about this earlier as a tourist thing, um, maybe it's not not very interesting unless you're a proper tea enthusiast because it's just literally uh, a few trees surrounding a, a, an opening. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, anyway, you <clears throat> is not a very touristy area, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah. It's not like Jing Mai. Maybe be, just because there's no push from the government, actually, because. It all comes down to this, like, you know, Jing Mai gets kind of touristy mainly because the government puts the investments right. towards it. And there's a reason for that, it's that uh, Jing Mai is in Lansang County, and Lansang County is the poorest one in poor, hmm. in poor. so yeah. it's like their main asset there, and they want to, to value it. Yeah. While if you're in Sichuan, Mana, in Mongla, they have the borders, they have yeah. lots of exports and stuff. Correct. Yeah. So, so financially, with with the rise of poor tea, uh, Mongla is doing comparatively well compared to other tea producing regions. Mm. Yeah. Um, Sichuan Bana in general, as a tea producing region, is, is doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Overall, the economy is good. While in Lansang, the people are quite poor actually outside of Jing Mai. So that's why they. They are trying to <coughs> to use Jing Mai to create jobs, I guess, mm. in the surrounding mountains and like open the airport, stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, let, let's get back. Yeah, so th that tea has a very, very interesting fragrance, very, 
how to say penetrative fragrance it really goes in the in yeah. the nose it, go, it goes right through right down the back of the throat it, it, yeah it sticks to the palate very very well <clears throat> And I, I only give this one rinse, okay. so we're still drinking the literally the first. The, what we what we normally do now is two rinses. Yeah, I've seen it's pretty common here. Uh, but yeah, this is technically the second rinse we're drinking. Oh. <laughs> you, okay. If you play it back, you'll probably see how how fast. Uh, we, the, the yeah, we never do that in Yunnan. I've only seen one rinse. Maybe because here people are used to drinking um, HT and maybe depending on the storage condition yeah. it's better to rinse it twice. Um, no, it's just uh, the, the first two rinses, like uh, the, the teas don't open up very quickly, especially HT. Mm -hmm. um, for fresh tea it's not such a big deal, that's why we're, we're drinking after one rinse. Sometimes I taste the rinse as well, just to, just to check how much um, mm -hmm. it's, it's releasing. <coughs> Oh yeah, that's a nice fragrance. Yeah. Uh, there's also a little trick here, uh, ah. because yesterday I noticed the humidity was already going up, mm -hmm. and humidity, excess humidity, really affects like uh, your perception of aroma. Mm -hmm. So having the AC on kind of helps. Because um, yeah, yesterday I wasn't getting the aromas of those teas that we tried. Mm. So this is, let's say this is west of Hiwu, mm -hmm. right? Gadang is uh... Technically, yeah. Slightly, mostly west, slightly northwest. Clo uh, kind of on the same road, on the same path as uh, Yibang, mm. which is also That's, quite famous. Yeah, we'd say like Xiangming area, yeah. right? You have uh, right. Xiangming, which is about the same size as Yiwu, it's a town. And around this uh, Xiangming, you have several of those uh, mountains. Yeah. A lot of uh, there's uh, there's definitely a lot of good tea over there, but mm. um, yeah, the processing's maybe not as consistent as it is in the EU. So this is an example of a tea that wasn't being produced well at the time we met the the people processing mm -hmm. there, and this is uh, this is tea that we bring back fresh leaf to process ourselves now. Oh, okay. Yeah. When you say it wasn't processed well, like uh, what what were the problems in the processing? Um, uneven heating, uh, uneven moisture level when firing. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the setting sat stages. Generally, one of the biggest kind of uh, kind of more likely to be erroneous in terms of. Um, so quite often these guys were undercooking their teas or overcooking their teas. To the point where they burnt the teeth. Oh, really? Yeah. Overcooking. Yeah. So yeah, basically control of moisture, um, the the way they stage, and then the firing stage um, was very inconsistent. So sometimes, like some of their batches were really nice, like this, and some of the bat well, a, a large majority of the batches were uh, unusable mm. for our purposes. I just find it surprising that well, these areas have a long history of tea production. And yet, you still find many processing issues there. Um, they have a history, but that history was broken, remember? Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, th there's a point where um, people had to come back and reintroduce the, the tea making culture to these mm. families who basically were too poor to focus on tea production. And that's why you see the rubber plantations, that's why you see the oh, rubber okay. plantations, is because that was easy money at that time. Mm. It wasn't that much money to invest in and it was easy to get people from outside to, to invest that money for those farmers to focus on that type of agriculture. Mm. Tea, 30-40 years ago, was worth very very little to farmers and um, basically during that break, during that period of, of uh, non-tea production, there was basically no training happening. Okay. So a lot of farmers do not know how to make tea properly and it's only recently with the tea for a tea boom in the last 15 years or so mm. that people serious about tea would get into tea making 
bearing in mind that, as you know, as a tea producer, it's a very, very tedious, laborious workload for, for the times that you're producing tea. Yeah, yeah, and well, mainly, um, I find that usually when people don't process tea well, it's because uh, they don't really know what are the um, quality standards, like they don't really know what their customers expect. Okay, so like we yeah. were in Laos and uh, we had those teas, like they, they had a, smoke, a smoky taste, you know, mm -hmm. but the guys didn't really understand, well, they didn't really know actually that that smokiness was considered a bad criteria. Yeah. Actually, for them, it was maybe better to have it smoked. So, mm -hmm. but I guess <laughs> they still have contact. I mean, in Iwu, the, the customers are very close to the farmers. Yeah. So, so actually, you'll find that now, like um, with different farmers connected with different factories and uh, different sales networks, mm. they'll be requesting very specific types of processing. So you'll see in the same village one one family or one or two families processing in one very particular way, mm. and the other families processing in, in a noticeably different way. Um, you know, the same with our village in Galshan. Like uh, there, was, there was a few um, families connected with very big factories and uh, they process a very specific way for those factories mm. while they will actually change the way they process for a different factory source. Mm, that's and, uh, very interesting. It depends on who's pre-ordering the, the, the leaf. Yeah, and it shows, I think, that there isn't one right way to process tea really. Yeah. Each customer has its specification. Exactly. And well, let's say if your business is to produce to to sell matcha to different customers, you have to be able to, to adapt to those different requests. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes in in Jingmai you have the uh, one one tea boss will tell you, yeah, this is bad tea because it should be more red, it should be more fragrant or something. Right. Another one will say, no, it, uh, yeah, it should be greener, stuff like that. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, I'll show you how to do it. Yeah. And he makes something like green tea, you know, half rolling in the walk and stuff. <laughs> but of course, they all think that they, they know how to make proper tea. And yeah, as a tea professional, you have to listen to them. And if you want to sell them the tea, just... Uh, yeah, yeah. It gets to the point of, if, like for those farmers, if, if they pull out those pre-orders, then you know that's a lot of tea to have processed a very particular way mm -hmm. that will may or may not be quite hard to sell on if, if those buyers don't pay the money for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you mean it can be very, very particular, very specific or...? I mean, um, you know, the farmers in general don't have that much uh, capital to work with, unlike, yeah. the uh, unlike the factory bosses. So, you know, picking up that fresh leaf to process for, for the, you know, there's a difference between the, the farmer families and the factory people who are processing leaf. Factories obviously have their own style, mm -hmm. whereas farmers will probably sell to one or more factories. Okay. So if you're selling to more than one factory, it's very likely that you're processing it uh, differently in some way or another mm. for those factories. And so you say most of those factories are located in Yiwu, in Yiwu town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you, you know, if you process that one uh, for one factory, you don't want it. You'll probably try and sell it to another factory. And uh, okay. you know, I, I might suit their taste better. So there's plenty of tea factories in the EU so but it's it, it's quite hard work going, you know, from factory to factory trying to sell your malcha. Now do you have um, buyers from outside EU that go directly to the farmers and yes. want to buy tea? Um, with the roads being uh, opened up and repaved. Um, and there are even more roads connecting the villages now. Mm. So yeah, there's more and more outsiders going directly to village uh, farmers and asking them, uh, especially during the tea producing seasons, like spring, you'll see you know kind of random city folk, mm -hmm. like just people, hobbyists, going up just to pick a few kilos of uh, very fresh uh, produce, literally fired that night and tried in the morning. Mm, okay. <clears throat> so yeah, people are, are buying very directly from farmers these days. And I think that that could explain partly the the increase in price actually that we've seen over the years. Yeah. 
that's um, that's that's very much um, when when they were buying in such low quantities, uh, direct and uh, they're going directly to consumers. Mm. Um, they're charging much closer to former retail prices. So then the factory prices have to kind of they, they get inflated as a result because the farmers mm -hmm. don't want to sell uh, such a difference in price. You know they 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 want to sell directly to city folk yeah. uh, at at the closer to retail price rather than sell to the factory. But there's no way that the these kind of like uh, visitors can pick up the quantity that factories pick up. Yeah. Okay. So the the it's a different business model. But yeah, it's it's very much affected the whole of the Euro region. Um, all of the most famous gardens with the gushus. Um, you know, people know where they are now, and it's not that difficult to go find them. Uh, mm. So actually, um, it's it's pretty direct now. You know, a lot of city folk will just go and visit the the gardens directly, and uh, wait for a, a chance to basically try and uh, bargain with the farmers so they can do some from those. Okay, trees. I see. <clears throat> Well, even like what what happens commonly in Lao Banjang is the the buyers wait in in the tea gardens and um, they will process the tea themselves, or uh, you know they just buy the fresh leaves and process process yeah. them in the farmer's in, walk. In the most extreme cases, yes, yeah, that happens in Europe. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, depends depends how how much of a or which type of people are going. Um, so factories often send like uh, people up to oversee uh, large productions. So you know they'll they'll buy up fresh leaf and, and go to a local processing center, and they'll have basically selected people that they uh, have trained themselves to process the way they want. Mm. Uh, so yeah, these these sorcerers will literally stand at the uh, in the garden and watch the picking. To make sure the picking standards are up to scratch, to make sure the yeah, and to uh, make sure they don't smuggle no the from other <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, there's obviously been a lot of talk about Laos tea. Yeah. Uh, in recent years, and, yeah. and the fact that uh, you know Laos tea gets moved into Euro to be sold, so that, you know uh, these factories have to be very kind of careful mm -hmm. about what they're paying for for fresh leaf from Euro. And uh, well, what they pay for for uh, tea from Lao is obviously not the same. Yeah, and I, as I understand, the um, the way tea trade is done in Yiwu is is more complex than say in Jingmai or Munhai area because the each tea garden has its own price. Like you really have a, a very a very precise differentiation that occurs yeah. between between each tea garden. Yeah. Um, that's very much because, in terms of the gardens, there's a there's a specific age uh, mm. a, a kind of a association with certain gardens. It's only the Gusha gardens that get the the real um, high prices, and the rest really don't compare. Mm -hmm. So so it's you know at, at some level it, it's not always a quality thing. It's it's more of a authentic authenticity and prestige. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you know, like uh, when you're getting tea from the from the truly ancient, the oldest trees in a particular uh, village, then that's what has a, a kind of differentiated price. That doesn't mean the the, the other gushu in the village aren't great as well, but you know people seek out the oldest trees, the tallest trees, the biggest trees, mm -hmm. and they get differentiated in price as a result. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have some families that have maybe slightly younger gardens, maybe only 50, 70 year trees uh, are the majority. And obviously you can't really charge grocery prices for those trees, uh, or, or at least not as close. Mm. <clears throat> what would you say is the difference between um, like big trees and small trees in terms of taste? Um, <clears throat> Like you could probably taste it, like uh, in this particular production we're tasting here. Mm -hmm. It's really in terms of the the clarity. Like we're talking about single estates, right? Mm -hmm. So the clarity of the aroma, the cleanliness of the taste, uh -huh. is, the, is the purity, the thickness, uh, the, the the 
kind of, um, I guess in English, the completeness of the flavor. Whereas like for young trees, it kind of, it's kind of maybe a little, like you taste exactly the same thing if it comes from the same garden, generally. Mm -hmm. Except it's not as full, it's not as clear. It's, it's maybe if it's uh, more quality, it will taste even a little bit more watery, would be a, a, an easy way to describe that. Okay, so Whereas it's related to thickness and maybe the, the presence of tea, the mouthfeel, yeah, the, 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 the activeness or something like that. Yeah, the purity of the flavour. The yeah. purity. Imagine, uh, I, I guess a, a, a very kind of simple way to think about it is maybe if you take the two teas, put them side to side, mm -hmm. it's as if the, the, the younger trees will have maybe a little bit of water added to it. Okay. Yeah. It feels more diluted. Somewhat, yeah. That's an oversimplification, of course, but yeah. that's probably an easy way to... It's, it's really hard to explain in words. It's, it's a lot easier to understand if you can have a side-by-side -side yeah, tasting. Yeah, that, like that word, like purity, it sound, if you haven't drunk uh, like Gusu and that kind of purity, it's, uh, it sounds like, like a bit... Um, uh, uh, I mean, stories, you uh, know, but uh, especially I can understand purity in yeah in terms of taste, yeah. Yeah, I mean, talking about the poor market, right? Like uh, that kind of description makes it sound like it's really easy to fake, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so until you've tasted the quality of of true gushu, you really don't know what what level of purity you can get, uh, what what level of um, kind of. Um, that, yeah, that that sense of quality. I like to compare. I like to compare that poor tea to chicken soup actually, because mm. you really have the same difference in chicken soup. Yeah. When you have like an industrial chicken, you just boil it, you make a soup, and you'll get a basic broth, you know. But when yeah, you have, it will that, taste like chicken, but yeah. <laughs> but when you have that good chicken with a yellow soup. Very very fat and um, mm. and you can feel and you can feel the hui gan just like <laughs> yeah, right. really yeah. in a in a good uh, a, yeah, a, like free range chicken or a, a good chicken soup has a very very strong fragrance to it right uh, not yeah. not bad fragrance yeah. but <laughs> like you know as a quality to it that you can't get in say a supermarket chicken broth you know <laughs> and I think it's why you know. Mm, in terms of taste, like it's hard to, to describe or, or even to measure scientifically, you know, what, what's a good taste and what's a bad, bad taste. And actually, I think it, it, it's part of the reason why the, um, the food industry has a hard time making as good a product as the, the artisanal products mm -hmm. because it's just hard to measure, really, yeah. to quantify, you know, what, <laughs> what makes a good taste. Yeah. And, um, I mean, um I've been, I've been watching a lot of uh, sourdough making videos, a bit of a ASMR, <laughs> but uh, these these kind of like um, kind of home cooks making sourdough bread, and like even just watching it, I can understand the level <laughs> of quality like uh, that that comes from because I I used to bake a little myself. Oh as yeah. Well, and uh, back back when I was in the UK at least. And uh, yeah, I, you know the difference between a well-made bread and uh, a badly made bread or a, or a mass market bread mm. is very very clear, but it's very hard to kind of quantify in a sense, like because you're mm. you're using the same like you can literally use the same ingredients like flour, yeast, water, bit of salt, right? <laughs> and yeah. just you can actually get a very very different flavor just mm -hmm. in terms of processing. <clears throat> yeah, and tea is quite the same, and that's where you have that concept of tea, which of course is a bit mystical and mm. yeah, just very hard to define yeah. and hard to understand if you don't experience it yourself. Yeah. But by the way, this tea is excellent, really. Yeah. Um, you can also tell. I mean, uh, that I, I, um, we use this style of brewing um, tea in the mountains for tasting, and it's literally like um, a very good amount of tea and always flash brewing because mm. with the flash brewing you can tell when you're getting say imagine a Thai tea uh, a, a plantation tea it brews out really kind of like when you put too much tea it brews out really bitter and astringent and, and the flavour is still watery 
Mm. Whereas when you're flash brewing a, a good quality gushu that's well processed, the flavour comes out uh, and it's really thick and clear, but the astringency and bitterness doesn't come out with it at the same time. Mm. Of course, with this much leaf, if you if you leave it over steeping too long, of course it's going to have some bitterness and astringency. Yeah, but usually if you have good tea, it feels powerful, but not not bad, not pukery, you know, like... Yeah. A, it doesn't feel uncomfortable. That's a test, like if you don't have time and, and want to check the tea, just brew it very strong and see if you can handle it. And yeah. if you can handle it very strong, then it's good tea. <laughs> that's my philosophy about this. That's, uh, that's, that's what we would describe as a basic quality test. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if it passes that test, then at least it's passable. It, it's, not, it's not bad tea. That's what, uh, that's what we would describe. Yeah, well, that's what the, the tea tasters do, do in India, everywhere in the mm, world. Yeah. When they test, test the batches, it's like that kind of basic quality yeah. test. Yeah, so that's interesting. I can see the leaves are, well, some of the leaves are slightly reddened here, including the buds mm -hmm. and a little bit the stems. So how many, um, yeah, how long do you, do you fry the tea for the shatsing? Um, it does depend mm -hmm. on, because this leaf has to get transported from Gurdon back to Gaoshan. Okay. So it depends on how much, um, the, the moisture has uh, mm. been released from the tea. So, uh, you know, some, some, some of the leaf might need a little bit more way down when it gets back to, to Gaoshan. Some of the can, sometimes it can get fried immediately. Oh, um, really? And if it can get fried immediately, it can be a, anywhere from 20, 25 to 30 minutes normally under a, a more, more, more standard, okay. uh, more standard processing. But if it's already very dry, it might be a little bit quicker. Yeah, usually if the tea gardens are far away, the problem is that uh, they, they will put it on a motorbike and then uh, it will be shaken like during transportation. Yeah. And that turns the, that makes the, the tea, the leaves turn red, yes, slightly yeah. red. You have red spots. Yeah. So that can occur. Well, here, what I that's, that's pretty common in Yuo because all mm. of the all of the good gushu gardens are very remote from the villages. Mm. The you know these gushus are not like ten minute walk from the village. You, you know you have to trek for like even the close ones are normally at least an hour or an hour and a half. The further ones are away like three four hour trek. So um, yeah, if if there's yeah. no motorbikes, that's a very very long trek, and motorbikes can only get you a part of the way. Mm. So yeah. Um, it's it's not common to have very green gushu or, or, or kind of like non reddened gushu leaves. Mm. This family has a uh, quite a large, quite a large garden, and uh, we we are now basically offering to take the whole production, take all mm. of the fresh leaf, or um, tell us when they're processing, so we can help them oversee the processing in future. Because. Um, yeah. Oh, ma they maybe burned, they burnt quite a large batch last mm. last year. They burnt. The they batch. actually burnt the batch last year, like some like 40, 50 kilos. Of really? It burnt. How can they burn so much? Um, just it's like not uncontrolled processes. Or... I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like for us tasters. It's like it's uh, you know the the burnt taste was there, and it, you know for our kind of uh, purposes. We couldn't sell it at the prices we're asking for uh, because yeah. the fresh leaf is very. I expensive. think that they made the basic mistake that many mm. farmers do. Yeah. They they mess up with one batch and they say, okay, I'm gonna blend it with the rest, and they won't see it, you know. But I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so 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 there's a few bags that had the burnt taste. There's a few yeah. bags that didn't have the burnt taste, and you're like, what but happened? But maybe they yeah. just made that mistake on one batch, you know. But instead of putting that batch aside. They just blended it with the rest of their teas. Yeah, probably when packing, they, they kind of threw the. Because maybe maybe it was one processor. Maybe they, I I think they had like two or three people. In the oh, box, you think? And uh, one processor was just burning everything, and uh, he was burning. So you think he burned all of those batches, like ten uh, batches? All, all probably his wax, yeah. Because <laughs> wow. uh, they they process a, a few a few wax in the evening. Because when these when these teas sprout, they, they sprout quite quickly over spring, right? So. But that's quite surprising sometimes. Like um, 
I mean, uh, well, these farmers usually are not rich people, and when you see the price at which they sell it, it must be quite a lot for them. And yet, on some stuff, they don't pay much attention I mean, on how they process. You, you've got to remember, for, for them, it probably still tastes fine. But for us, because we're yeah. very picky on, like, you know, we, we want to sell the, we want to buy the highest quality processing and mm. sell at the highest quality price. Yeah. The, the rest probably gets sold back to factories for, for their blends. Mm. You know, people who can accept a bit of a, either a smoky or a charred or mm. you know, that kind of wok, kind of high fired wok flavor. Uh, so that kind of uh, situation, you know, it's not that it can't get sold, it's just the fact that it doesn't meet our needs. Um, you know, we're, okay, so we're, you we're very much, um, our side of the business is very, very much more picky than your average um, mm. buyer. Um, but of well, course, I, that's what every vendor says, so take yeah. that with a pinch of salt if, if you like. Of course, but usually, well, it just depends on the quantity you're producing. Yeah. You know, like if you, if you have like 50 tons to make, you don't have time to really sort through the batches and yeah, make yeah. sure that the, the leaves you buy really come from Wufu and stuff. Yeah. And when you do small quantities, yeah, you can have that such a high standard. Yeah. And that's what's hard for us is to increase the production while, while retaining the same level of quality. Mm. Because with more production, you have less time to control each batch and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. So how much did you make this year? In terms of uh, how many kilos of tea did you did you process? Did I process? <laughs> well, I mean your family. Or... My, my family. Um, <clears throat> I I don't know the exact numbers to be honest, uh, but I mean uh, they were, they were working. We had we had to hire a lot of extra hands. Even for the processing. Yeah. Oh. Um, we're we're processing a lot more tea than than, than we used to. Because of situations like this, where the farmers, uh, we're getting more and more orders for our highest quality teas, so we have to oversee the processing ourselves to meet that demand for mm. that level of quality. So we're we're bringing up more and more fresh leaf to Galshan to process ourselves. Um, so in terms of pure gushu, we probably processed uh, pro <coughs> closer to maybe three four. Probably about 400 kilos of pure gushu ourselves. 400 kilos in spring? In or, spring, yeah. in spring. Well, it's still We're not very active in, in yeah. autumn. We only, we only pick, uh, and it's not always available, but we only uh, search for gushu in autumn if there's a request for it. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> so we don't always pick in autumn, actually. We we only pick if uh, if there's a request for it, because mm. uh, it's it's just better for the trees, and uh, if if cash flow isn't the biggest issue, it's it's more about looking after the gardens. So like last yeah. last year we only picked from like uh, we have several gardens in Galshan and we only picked from two of them mm. uh, last year. This year, well half the time it was two too rainy to pick. So, yeah, how do you decide whether you, you pick the garden or not? Um, the specifics, my, um, I, I don't know how my father decides this, but basically um, they let the trees kind of and the weather decide. Okay. So, so the trees are, are maybe weren't, you know, it's, it's something related to the amount of production over spring and uh, how well the trees grew over summer. Uh, and you know how how well it's sprouting uh, in in autumn. So and like I said, if if there's no really major uh, any major pre-orders, we actually just uh, stop picking uh, and give the trees uh, the older trees a break at least. Oh okay, yeah. that's interesting. Well, in Jing Mai, like last autumn, we we did we didn't pick pick some of the the gardens in the late harvest because it was constantly raining maybe yeah. for 10 days it was raining every day so yeah. there was no way to go pick tea and by the time you get out there it's already too old you're just picking yeah. a batch of corn can yeah because so is it worth worth the effort sometimes yeah so that's the thing you have the the flush growing so you have to wait 
for the, the right moment. So usually you want to start picking when it's one but three leaves on average. And then maybe you have three, three, four days during which the, the flush is still growing. Yeah. So you can still pick what you want. But it's getting more and more mature every day. That means you will have more and more Huang Pian in the batch. Yeah. And at some point, so it, it just turns old and, and you, you cannot pick anything. Yeah. But it's good then, like you say, it allows the tea to grow. Yeah, the, the trees grow. Now the problem is usually if you don't pick the flesh, it's going to grow flowers on the next uh, round, let's say, mm. and you won't have tea leaves. So in Jing Mai at least, that, that's a reason uh, the farmers tell that that's why they pick tea in summer, it's actually to have a, a good yield in autumn. Right. If you don't pick tea in summer, you'll have many flowers in, in autumn. Right. But the, the, the problem there is, if you pick in summer, you're, you're potentially overpicking the, the teas. Well, it could be. I think, to me, overpicking is really when you don't leave any, any leaf on the flesh. Mm. I'd say it's okay to, to, to pick frequently but you should leave uh, some leaves on the flesh, you shouldn't pick the whole stuff. Right, yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not so well researched on the actual kind of management of gardens, but mm. yeah, that's, that's generally the case is, you know, um, you leave enough, tree, uh, enough leaves, and if you want a better flush in the, in the following uh, season, you want to have pruned back some of the, the unnecessary leaves and, and branches if you haven't picked it recently. Yeah, yeah. And of course that pruning usually affects quality. You get a lower quality right after you've pruned. Mm. You can see it when you buy the, the fresh leaves. Mm. Do you collect the fresh leaves sometimes in the mountain? Yeah. So yeah, you, you can tell the difference between all those uh, areas and stuff. How do you make the difference between between gushu leaves and and like uh, plantation leaves in EU? Um, the, I guess uh, the easiest way is to look at the stems. Yeah. The the quality of the stems. Because uh, I mean, I, I, as you know, like most of the the gushus in in Yiwu are large trees. Yeah. Like very large trees. So the, the stems are typically thicker, but not always, especially in early spring, you've got to be careful. Oh. Um, but like uh, the, the quality of the stem, the, the slow growth, um, you, you normally typically get much stiffer, stronger stems. On stronger the stems. Yeah. And also thicker. Um, apart from, apart from no. spring, early spring, like uh, oh. sometimes they don't grow as fast. So that, it's it's not a there's not a science like uh, I wouldn't say it's a science at this point like de depending on the season depending on the trees depending on the garden yeah, the yeah it's really hard there's a lot of factors and usually that that, you can have conflicting factors like to me like thicker stems usually in Jing Mai it means that the tea trees have been pruned usually when you have pruned mm. uh, plantation tea they get like thicker thicker stems okay. Well, at least that's what I get from Jing Mai, but um, it's, uh, it depends on each mountain. Yeah. Usually, uh, in Iwo, you, you like to pick very, very large stems, like a long part of the stem. Um, yeah. That's, like in Jing Mai, you want them to pick at the base of the last leaf. The, yeah. You don't want to pick them to pick with the stem. Right. But <laughs> I guess it's just a habit. It's um, just a picking. Yeah, it's just normal. Uh, picking standards for for you mm. like uh, you, you again different different factories will order different picking standards for for oh, yeah. certain gardens, mm. especially when you get into the to kind of uh, more mass production gardens. They have a very kind of uh, particular request okay. for for how to you know, pick very specifically. But most hired helpers, if you don't have a very very clear in the standard, they'll just pick as much as they can. Okay. So you just kind of get what you get, really, in, in, in those cases. Mm. <clears throat> so, you know, it's like if you're not picking yourself, you're probably going to get quite a variation. Well, well it depends. Like for, for mm. Jing Mai, we use a lot of uh, Burmese workers or people from outside. But, but yeah, we, we have some standards, of course. We control what, what they pick a little bit. 
but yeah, I guess there's no problem. It's just uh, maybe it's. I feel like it's a difference between what's east of the Mekong and west of the Mekong. Actually, I think. I mean, basically, if you're if you're picking the trees today, you're very unlikely gonna pick it tomorrow unless, like the the same trees, like if they, like that you you just pick one part of the garden, mm. right? If and basically what's ready for picking, you, you know you you definitely take. Um, that's generally the case because you're not going to be visiting those gardens uh, or that side of the garden every day to check which leaves are tender enough. For those very kind of specific picking standards that some of the factories request, they have to go to the garden, like that part of the garden every day and uh, pick the leaves that are more ready and not pick the leaves that aren't, you know, matching the standards exactly. Yeah, and basically that's why we make tidy because when you make a picking table, you've got the same grade growing on the whole tea garden. Yeah. That's actually the main point of having a picking table. Yeah. When you make green tea or black tea and you want nice one but one leaf. Yeah, but like uh, you know, from my experience, like uh, Puar like doesn't you know doesn't really need that specific. Uh, 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 yeah, we don't standard. care about this. It's, so. it's not like buds only or one bud one leaf. It's like one bud yeah, yeah. and up to three leaves so yeah anyway like you say it's very impractical to to have uh, picking standards the only time usually in Jingmai we, we get picking standards is in autumn when uh, usually the the leaves get um, get mature very quick yeah and if you don't buy it, uh, a standard picking uh, they you'll get a lot of pumpkin actually you'll get maybe half 50 percent of your your dry weight will be will be Huangkian yeah. and at that time it, it might it makes sense to to pay twice the price actually to get uh, only tender leaves right yeah so maybe it's the, the same in, uh, in Yiwu yeah it's, it's, it's not that different like autumn prices are a lot lower for that mm. reason it's because the fresh leaf that you're getting it's very likely going to increase the amount of Huangkian that you're getting and the resale value of you know, Huangkian mm. is obviously commercially much more difficult uh, when you're paying that type of prices for that type of yeah. uh, you know the, especially when you're working with bushy gardens it can get very uh, it can be a bad investment in fact mm. and that's why we only pick that's one of the reasons we only pick when there's a pre-order there's no point in, in you know you have to be very careful not to pay for you're paying by weight right so if you're paying by weight and you're getting a large percentage one pen it's very easy to make a loss on that particular batch. Mm. Well, you know, obviously coming from other gardens. I guess you guys have your own. You you guys actually have your own garden, right? Yeah, we have a few yeah. gardens. Yeah. We have um, like, yeah, one one hectare basically one hectare of uh, busu and two point five hectares of uh, of shantai, which is. Not that much by Jingmai standards, usually people have a lot of tea gardens there. Mm. Uh, so usually all of our Shantai is our own uh, tea gardens. And then the Gushu, maybe one third of our production comes from our own gardens. Mm. But I'd say it doesn't really matter in the end because people are all relatives and what matters is where, where those gardens are located and how they are managed. Yeah. Really, who owns them is not that important. Yeah. In, in, in terms of trading, I guess it's, it's the, the more difficult standard. When someone's giving you uh, offering fresh leaf at a certain price, and uh, you know you you have to make a decision on whether that price for that fresh leaf is viable or not. Um, so autumn becomes more difficult because working with bushy gardens, and uh, you know, you're, you're offering a certain price. If their picking is not very standard, and that's often the case with with the bushy gardens in Europe. Uh, yeah, you, you do get a lot of pumpkin. And, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Usually, I count like a ratio of maybe six kilo fresh leaves for one kilo of uh, dry tea, or even seven. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to to sort it clean. Yeah, it depends. Usually, if you don't have pumpkin, it's maybe four point five. Yeah, but you're gonna have a lot of pumpkin in, in autumn. Yeah. Now, of course, you can also sell those pumpkin, so it's not a total loss, but. Uh, at a much lower price, of course. Yeah.